Hey everybody, how's it going? Everybody can hear me okay, right? Can't really tell up here, so it seems like, okay. Uh, my name is Josh Wills. Uh, I am Cloudera's uh, Senior Director of Data Science. I've been with Cloudera for about three years now. Uh, before I was at Cloudera, I was at a company called Google. Spent about three and a half years at Google. My first job there was working on the ad auction. It's like you do a search on Google and ads show up. That was me. I decided where ads should go, how much people should pay, all that good stuff. You're welcome. <laughs> Nobody ever thanks me for that. It's one of those things. Uh, did that for a couple of years. After that, uh, I got interested in Google's data infrastructure. Uh, so I kind of put together like a little sort of analytics tiger team, and we went around building you know, dashboards, experiment frameworks, machine learning systems, logging systems, feature flags, all that kind of good stuff. All the sort of data infrastructure you need to launch a product at Google. A lot of it got used in Google News, a lot of it got used in Google Plus, a lot of it got used in Google Mobile Search. Um, and so now at Cloudera, I have this kind of like fake job where I just kind of go around and talk about doing data analysis as opposed to actually doing it. Um, but anyway, it's, it's pretty cool. They pay me and everything like that, so it's, it's kind of awesome. Um, and I'm a, I'm a senior director of data science, and I'm, I'm a data scientist. And we'll talk a little bit about like what exactly is a data scientist. Uh, there's a couple of different definitions I've seen that are, uh, that are popular. Uh, this was the first one I ever saw, actually. Uh, data scientist is a data analyst who lives in California. Uh, and this is, this is a great definition for a couple of reasons. It's also sort of a terrible definition, um, but it's a great definition. Uh, I mean, one, obviously, it's a great definition because we get to make fun of like pretentious California people. And that's like always a, always a good time. Um, but it's also great because it's an example of uh, mistaking correlation and causation. Um, in particular, it is you know, the correlation between people living in California and calling themselves data scientists. And this, the problem is, of course, this definition excludes data scientists who live in Kansas City and New York and Chicago and all kinds of other great cities, right? Uh, so this is my definition. Um, and this will be like my lasting contribution to Western civilization, uh, which is like kind of a proper defensible definition of a data scientist. Someone who is better at statistics than any software engineer and better at software engineering than any statistician. So anyway, that's been retweeted like 800 something times now, which gives me roughly the same level of Twitter credibility as whatever Justin Bieber had for breakfast this morning. So <laughs> it's good to know kind of where you stand in the grand scheme of things. Um, but this will be on my tombstone. All right. Uh, so in my, in my experience, I've kind of run into two kinds of data scientists that have sort of, sort of emerged from the definition I came up with. Uh, and I call them the lab data scientist and the factory data scientist. And I think the lab data scientist is probably what you, what you sort of normally think of when you think of a data scientist. It's someone who's like, basically it's a statistician or a geneticist or a neuroscientist or a social scientist who got really good at programming. They were interested in some scientific problem, some, some, uh, some scientific question that involved working with lots of data, um, doing a lot of data munging, and sort of uh, in the process of solving whatever problem they were trying to solve, they got really good at programming, okay? So that's like model A, right? And then there's model B, um, which is a little bit closer to my heart, and that's the factory data scientist. And these are, these are software engineers who are in the wrong place at the wrong time. All right, let me explain what I mean by that. I think we all, all of us have worked with software engineers who you know, are like clearly smart, right? Sort of young guy, young woman, clearly, clearly smart, got a lot going on, but they're not like obviously useful, right? It's not really like quite clear like what exactly you should do with this like smart person. Like they're not really obviously like good at anything. They're just kind of smart. Um, I, used to, I used to be this kind of software engineer, so I'm speaking from experience here. Uh, and what you do with this kind of software engineer is you come up with some sort of like weird hypothetical problem that would be like, you know, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we had like a recommendation engine that we could use to like recommend content to people so they'd like come visit our site more often? I'm like, okay, yeah, that'd be kind of cool. It'd be sort of neat. I mean, that's not a pressing kind of urgent thing. Uh, let's give it to that smart sort of not obviously useful person who's not actually working on something else uh, and tell them to go build it and see if they come up with something cool. You know what I mean? Like that's roughly... And, and that's, that's how this software engineer becomes a data scientist. That's, that's what happens to them. They sort of like, they go, they read a bunch of books about recommendation engines, they start coding something up, and they like build some kind of prototype, and it's sort of cool, and it turns out to be kind of neat, and they end up launching it, and that's, that's roughly, they, they sort of pick up a bunch of machine learning uh, just sort of on the side through their own kind of reading, through their own experience. Um, so anyway, that was, that was my story, and that's, uh, that's, that's how those people, those, those poor, poor useless software engineers become, uh, become data scientists. Now, the funny thing is, when you're trying to kind of learn about machine learning, 
uh, what you need to know is that there's a very serious, very significant differences between like machine learning in books and machine learning in academia versus machine learning in industry. Um, machine learning in academia is essentially like applied math. It's essentially it's applied optimization theory. Um, this is just a graphic I grabbed, which is a bunch of different machine learning algorithms expressed as some function you want to optimize uh, and it has some constraints on it. So function optimize, bunch of constraints, solve the problem, machine learning model comes out. And that's, that's typically how machine learning is taught to people. It's taught as applied optimization theory. Um, and of course, you know, as is always the case, when we get into the real world, we find out there were some constraints on the problem we didn't really kind of know about in, in academia. Um, and the first one of these is, is, is systems precede algorithms. And this is a very, very important constraint. Roughly speaking, in software engineering, doing the same thing you're doing right now, like given some function, right, doing the exact same thing that function does, but faster, is almost always a good thing. Right? There's premature optimization and there's all that kind of stuff, right? But if you take a system and you make it faster, that's awesome. Users are happier, resource load is lower, everything gets better, right? Everything is doing the same thing but faster is always good. Anything that slows the system down, though, needs to be justified. And this is a problem for academic optimization theory um, because in, ac in academia, you get rewarded for like, basically beating kind of the performance of an existing model in terms of optimization by like 2%. So like you built a model and you got 2% closer to the optimal than the kind of current state of the art. But in order to do that, your algorithm needs to run for like four weeks. That can actually get you published, that can get a paper published in science, that can never actually launch in an industrial setting. Like we don't care about that that much. Like a 2% difference that has to run like n times longer is not a good thing in any kind of stretch, right? So that's kind of constraint number one. Uh, problem number two, is when it comes to kind of optimization theory, we're always interested in objective functions, very clearly defined, obviously optimizable objective functions. And these hardly ever exist in industry. Um, I worked in ads, and there's always kind of this sort of implied kind of rivalry between search and ads, you know, like at, at Google and other places. Like, we kind of hate each other. Um, you always like think that the search guys get all the credit and all the love and everything, and the, the search guys, it's the same thing. They think the ads guys get all the promotions because they make all the money. That's basically true, but leaving that aside, um, the search guys have an easy problem, right? Make the user happy within the constraints of Google's kind of resources, within the constraints of Google's data center infrastructure, stuff like that. Make the user as happy as possible. Um, the ads guys have a much more fun problem. They have a three-body problem. They have to make Google money. Uh, they have to make the user happy, or at least not piss them off too much. Um, and they have to generate ROI for the advertiser. They have to make money for the advertiser as well. Uh, and that's really, really hard to do. That's a three-body problem, right? You can op optimize any one of those functions, um, but optimizing all three of them at the same time is really, really, really hard. Um, so you say this and you say, okay, well, that's fine. Um, we could come up with kind of a composite objective function, some composite objective function where you like weight each of these factors and then we optimize the overall thing. And that would be great if that was actually possible. Um, the business doesn't actually really know what they want to have happen. They want everything to be awesome. They want, they want Google to make more money, they want advertisers to make more money, and they want users to be happy. They want all three things. They're not really willing to kind of do trade-offs most of the time, um, except in like sort of fairly unusual circumstances, like when the economy is imploding and everyone's freaking out. Um, there's not really a good way to kind of weight these objective functions. And so what we typically aim for is Pareto optimization. We try to improve one thing without like sort of hurting the other two things too much. That's roughly what we end up doing all of the time, right? So because we have multiple objective functions, we also have multiple deci decision systems. Whenever you see talks about machine learning in industry, like machine learning at Google or Bing or, or any of these companies, people always focus on CTR prediction, click-through rate prediction, predict the prob probability that people are gonna click on an ad. Um, and that's fine, that's a very important and very interesting machine learning problem. But you gotta know there's like 12 machine learning algorithms behind the scenes there, right? There is a, a post-click prediction model that tries to predict the probability that people will click on an ad and then come right back. That's really, really bad when that happens. We hate short clicks at search engines. Short click means you didn't find what you were looking for and we did a bad job as a search engine. There's budget machine learning models that are trying to constantly optimize advertiser budgets for them uh, in order to basically make sure that advertisers like spend is effectively utilized which is a nice way of saying so that Google makes lots and lots of money. 
Um, there are spam detection systems. There are fraud detection systems. There are all these machine learning systems. Um, so again, optimization in this world, it's kind of like you guys saw Iron Man 3. And if any of you managed to stay awake till the end of Iron Man 3, I applaud you. But at the end of Iron Man 3, I'm hopefully not going to spoil this for you, there's basically like 30 Iron Men that are all kind of flying around fighting these bad guys. Um, and that was always like, I see that, and I think that's an awesome optimization problem. It's like, not only do I have these individual systems, which are incredibly complicated, they're all basically like having to work together and interact with each other in order to defeat, you know, the evil bad guys. That's kind of roughly the problem we encounter at Google with like having 12 different machine learning systems all trying to work together at the same time. So that's one problem. Um, the other problem is everything is changing. Each of those teams that's responsible for each of those machine learning systems is trying to earn their bonus for the year, which means they're launching changes, they're deploying new features, they're trying new ideas. So everything is changing out un from underneath you all of the time, which is very, very unsettling. Uh, and as a result of this, we have a fairly massive complexity problem when it comes to industrial machine learning. Uh, and I had a very kind of visceral experience with this during my first few months at Google. So I joined Google late 2007, kind of early 2008. Uh, you guys remember the economy was roughly imploding at that time. That's what I'm talking about, right? Uh, and so Google obviously tracks the number of ads they show every single day. Uh, and they noticed that over like the period of a week or so, the number of ads being shown was kind of trending down fairly steadily, like falling day after day after day after day. People were like, okay, that's kind of weird, but hey, the economy is imploding. Maybe advertisers are like shutting down their budgets. Um, let's turn down some of the thresholds. Let's turn down some of the knobs we use to control how many ads get shown at a time, right? So we do that, so we turn down the knobs. It's a big wheel in Eric Schmidt's office. You just go in there, turn it. Number of ads goes back up. Number of ads goes back up for like a day, and then it starts falling again, right? And people basically started freaking out uh, because Google, for about a period of a month or two, effectively lost control of their ad system. Um, they had built a system by combining so many different machine learning models together that was so complicated, no one could actually reason or understand it anymore. It's sort of, um, yeah. So anyway, I'm, I'm new to Google at the time, and as a new Goog as a Noogler, um, you have a mentor, like someone you can ask for advice and, and all that kind of good stuff. My mentor was a guy named Daniel Wright, who's like maybe the best programmer I've ever seen in my life. And I asked him, uh, Daniel, is it possible the ad system has become self-aware? <laughs> Lots of feedback loops, that kind of thing, right? And that it doesn't like ads. <laughs> Usually I get more laughs on that line than the first one. That's okay. That's all right, fine. Um, so managing complexity is a really, really big problem for me. For what it's worth, it turned out that uh, two different un seemingly unrelated machine learning changes and two different machine learning models had created a feedback loop that was basically kind of slowly but surely eating all the ads, just kind of killing all the ads in the system, like disabling them all. And uh, yeah, it took a few weeks to figure that out by basically running a bunch of ablation experiments where you just turn stuff off until you figure out like what exactly is going on. Um, so in general, what I want to say is that in, you know, in industrial machine learning, my problem is not really optimization. My problem is understanding. Uh, a lot of, see a lot of academic literature uh, and sort of even some industry literature talks about things like multi-arm bandits. Okay, I mean, you guys ever seen multi-arm bandit sort of stuff? It's like there's a bunch of slot machines and you're trying to, they each have a different kind of payoff probability and you're trying to figure out which the best one is. So there's basically strategies you can use for kind of like exploring and exploiting and trying to maximize your payoffs. Um, that's not really my problem because my system is actually a bunch of slot machines that I'm actually allowed to open up and tinker with and change and modify and do sort of new things with. Um, so my focus is always on how do I understand what the system is doing come up with new hypotheses about this very complex system, test them, and then use what I learned from those tests in order to find new ways to improve the system. Okay, that's my, that's my rough overview of industrial machine learning. Uh, so I shifted this talk a little bit based on some things that have been launched over the last few months. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about machine learning frameworks. And uh, since I work at Cloudera, I'm gonna talk about machine learning frameworks on top of Hadoop. I'm not going to talk about Hadoop at all or explain Hadoop. I'm kind of in, this is more of the, the theory of things as opposed to the, uh, the kind of the, the nuts and bolts. Um, so I'm going to assume you know what Hadoop is and MapReduce and all that kind of good stuff. So I'm really very excited, I think, first and foremost. I think we're entering like a golden age uh, for industrial machine learning and in particular for industrial machine learning frameworks. Uh, since I submitted this proposal to Midwest I.O., there have actually been a number of companies that have open sourced or talked about their internal machine learning frameworks. And so I want to talk about some of those frameworks right now. Um, and the thing that has really made this golden age possible 
is a bunch of sort of uh, DevOps uh, practices that have kind of become standard in the industry <clears throat> that are really prerequisites for industrial machine learning. And so just kind of briefly, the prereqs, um, logging stuff, having like logging infrastructure for all of our operational systems, absolute requirement prerequisite for machine learning. Like being able to log all the features and all the predictions a model generates and then analyze those uh, predictions offline, absolute prerequisite for any kind of machine learning stuff we're going to do. Um, prerequisite number two, monitoring tools. Monitoring tools, stuff like Ganglia and, you know, like, uh, I forgot the name of that company. It's terrible. Anyway, companies that basically do monitoring infrastructure for you so that when you deploy a machine learning model, you can see immediately if it starts, like, dropping the number of ads shown or starts breaking something else in the system. This is absolute, absolute, absolute prerequisite for doing any kind of industrial machine learning. Um, and then one I'm very excited about, uh, these are, I, there's a bunch of different names for this, but feature flags or like feature toggles, that kind of thing, the ability to turn features on our application on and off selectively. This was kind of like the perfect tweet for feature flags, by the way. It's Shakira talking about Twitter unlocking the feature that allowed like hashtags for countries to like show up as the flags for the World Cup. So it was like, it was a feature flag for flags. I like that, that was, that was funny to me. Um, Feature flags, yeah, the ability to like mix and match and turn models on and turn models off all the time. Uh, absolute, absolute prerequisite for industrial machine learning. So if you're at your company, you're thinking, wow, it'd be awesome to throw that useless software engineer at a really cool machine learning problem, make sure you have this infrastructure in place first, right? Get the, get the basics out of the way. Um, so given those things, a lot of different frameworks. Um, we at Cloudera uh, open sourced a project called Oryx last November. So November 2013 or so, we released the system. Um, last summer, I acquired uh, a company called Mirix, uh, which was founded by a guy named Sean Owen. And Sean's kind of major claim to fame is that he wrote the kind of original recommendation engine that's used in Mahout, the collaborative filtering engine in Mahout. It's called Taste. Um, he started a company called Mirix. It kind of did a next generation recommendation engine. And I loved, I loved his recommendation engine because it both built and served models. So the idea of Oryx is you give it some data, it runs a bunch of machine learning algorithms, either like a recommendation engine, a clustering model, or a random forest model, and then it kicks out a PMML file that can be immediately loaded up into an associated Java server that can be used to actually serve predictions for that model, be they recommendations or predictions or anomaly detection or what have you, right? That was like a very big thing for me. I'm very interested in operational models, models that are not just built for offline use, that are not just built for reports or, you know, dashboards or anything like that, but models are actually running in production, like making decisions, all right? So this is framework number one. Framework number two, the Airbnb guys wrote a blog post, it's called Machine Learning for Risk um, at Airbnb, where they discussed their internal machine learning framework. And there's actually no Hadoop in this machine learning framework at all, but it actually kind of like has a nice sort of overview of the flow they use for solving these problems, for building machine learning models. Um, first things first, they kind of derive input features for their model. Their input features are just really simple, just key value pairs. There's some key, there's some associated value. It might be a Boolean value or it might be a number. That's it. These features just kind of come from somewhere, right? They can do transformations on those features, so bucketize them, add in missing values, normalize things, like very basic transformations. They train a model offline using scikit-learn. If you guys have any scikit-learn fans in the audience, it's a Python framework for doing machine learning. It's absolutely awesome. They train their models on just very small data sets, just small samples of data, building models in scikit-learn. They generate a PMML file. PMML is the same kind of file Oryx generates. PMML is the predictive modeling markup language. It's a horrible XML-based language uh, that has sort of become an industry standard for representing models. It's not horrible in and of itself, it's horrible that it's XML, that kind of thing, right? Nonetheless, um, they upload it to a Java server called Open Scoring. Um, open Scoring is a GPL-based model server. You just load up any PMML file in there and you can serve it to your heart's content. You can load up lots and lots of models. Inside of Open Scoring, they run some sort of tests, deployment tests, to make sure that the model predictions match what they saw in scikit-learn to verify their model is actually working. Um, and then they start scoring real-time data. So they start scoring the model. The model's not making decisions yet, but it's scoring observations that come in. And then when they evaluate those predictions, be they fraud or email marketing campaigns or whatever, um, they eventually promote the best performing model to be their kind of production serving model overall. So they're constantly serving lots of models. They're constantly running these kind of champion challenger contests where new models are being pitted against the current best. Um, and they're constantly iterating in new models. So 
great stuff. Very, very awesome of them to release that. Then I think like literally a week later, uh, Etsy released their machine learning framework. Um, Etsy's machine learning framework is called Conjecture, and they went sort of one step beyond Airbnb because they actually open sourced a lot of it. So it's up on GitHub, it's uh, slash Etsy slash Conjecture. Uh, Etsy's, if you guys don't know, if you've ever seen Etsy's, uh, you know, Etsy's DevOps team or anything talk, their entire operational infrastructure is done in PHP. I know, right, exactly. It's like the worst thing you can possibly imagine, right? Anyway, done entirely in PHP. I mean, may God have mercy on their souls. Um, their offline modeling, though, is done using Scalding. Uh, Scalding is a Scala-based kind of MapReduce language. It was eventually de uh, originally developed at Twitter. Um, so they basically had created a system for building um, classification models in Scalding, kicking them out as JSON files this time, not PMML, but JSON, and then using code generation to actually go from JSON to generate PHP code that can actually serve those models. Kind of crazy, right? Um, you know, there's a bunch of different sort of themes I kind of want to hit on in, these, in all these different systems. One of them, um, first and foremost, key value pairs. Uh, very, very, very simple data models that are input to these systems. Like key, I mean, key value pairs. It's about as simple as you could reasonably get, right? Very, very simple. Um, differences in the analytical environment um, versus the operational environment. At Airbnb, we saw Python is being used to build models, Python, R, that kind of thing. But in production, they're using Java to actually serve those models. At Etsy, they're using Scala to build the models, and then they're using PHP to serve the models, right? So there's this sort of like, there's a mismatch basically between the operational programming language and the analytical programming language. And I think we're gonna see this lots and lots of places. Um, last thing. All these companies, Oryx, uh, you know, Etsy, Airbnb, have a very small, fixed set of models they can deploy. At Airbnb and Oryx, that's a random forest for classification. Uh, at Etsy, it's a logistic regression model. And they build all of their models using just that. They're not like constantly switching back and forth or trying like the latest machine learning model that just got published in academia. They have a very small, fixed set of models they can deploy very, very quickly. All right, so all kind of good practices. Uh, for doing industrial machine learning. But the thing that was most interesting to me about all these blog posts, and, I'm, and, and even I wouldn't lump Oryx in, and kind of my criticism here, is the commonalities, be the commonalities between what each of these systems do and what they talk about is very interesting. But what's even more interesting is the things they don't talk about, the things we never actually mention as part of building machine learning models. Um, and that's feature engineering. We sort of all talk about feature engineering as this sort of black box process that isn't discussed, that isn't open sourced. Uh, it's like gets a passing reference in each of these blog posts. Um, I, for some reason, I like to put Oscar Wilde references in like my talks for some reason. So I gotta figure that out with my therapist. Um, that's the, the code that dare not speak its name. The love that dare not, okay, doesn't. And then I have to explain the Oscar Wilde references, which is like even weirder. <laughs> anyway, um, feature, engineering, feature engineering is the dark art of data science. We talk about like what exactly data science is. Data science at the end of the day is getting a mess, like a nightmarish, you know, horrible spaghetti ball of, of raw data into a form that can be used as an input to a machine learning algorithm. So you know what data you have, you basically choose a machine learning algorithm that you want to work with, and then you have this sort of horrible ETL process to convert the raw, disastrous, messy data into a form that machine learning model expects. Uh, and then you're going to do that again and again and again and again and again and again until the end of time. That's really like, roughly what we do. That is feature engineering. We are always looking for new sources of data. We are always looking for new transformations. We are always looking for ways to improve our model uh, by improving the data we have. All right, that's, that's really what we do as data scientists. And the problem we have, really the biggest problem we have, with doing operational models, with basically bringing models out of the lab and into the factory, uh, is that we work with data differently in an operational context versus an analytical context. And the kind of poster child for this is the star schema. The star schema is like, it's, you know, it's one of those ideas that is so powerful and so awesome and so amazing that we basically take it for granted now. It's like oxygen, right? We, it's just sort of accepted in analytical data analysis. And um, we don't even like think about it anymore. Um, so we work with, uh, when we work with models, when we're building models, we're typically working with aggregations of data, right? We're not just building sort of, we're not just analyzing a single user at a time. 
we're analyzing you know, hundreds, dozens, thousands, millions of users, millions of observations, and building a model over all of these different things. So all this feature engineering code we do is really kind of optimized for this bulk kind of processing of things. Um, but when we get back into an operational context, we're really like typically focused on a single user at a time, or a single observation, or a single event that we're trying to do predictions for, just at a single time. And what we end up with is this impedance mismatch between feature engineering in the offline analytical world, which is done against star schemas, and feature engineering scoring, which is done in an operational context, uh, against a single sort of user's bit of information at a time. And sort of the consequence of this is that we have engineers who have to take a bunch of SQL or SAS or R code that defines all this feature engineering logic uh, and translate it into C++ or Java or Python or PHP or whatever so that it can be used in the operational context where we're just seeing a single user at a time. And this is absolutely terrible. Like, this is just a seriously horrible situation. This is a terrible bit of software engineering. It's really, really tedious. It's just super, super not fun. Um, and so this is really the problem that no one's talking about, and it's the problem that we need to spend some time solving. Uh, and I don't have the answer, but I want to talk about a couple of different approaches here. Like, what exactly is it we need here? What is the missing piece um, to solve this problem, to allow us to go from operational to analytical and back again? I've been thinking about this for a few months, and the first idea I came up with uh, was a feature engineering DSL. What we really needed was a domain-specific language for feature engineering, um, something different from R and SQL and SAS and all that kind of good stuff, some new DSL that would allow us to kind of easily map transformations and feature creation sort of data analysis that's done in this offline analytical world uh, to the online operational world. And it's like, okay, well, this is a really fairly tedious problem for someone to solve, and it seems pretty hard. I don't necessarily know like, how to do this, so I'm going to need a fairly smart person to do this. So if you find yourself in a situation, this is like a manager tip, if you find yourself in a situation where you have a really hard, tedious problem that's going to need someone super smart to solve it, functional programming is your friend. Here's the key. Hire someone who's really, really good at functional programming. Actually, you can probably like, walk right over to the talk next door where they're talking about Haskell. Grab one of those people, right? Describe the problem to them, and then say, you know, I don't think there's a way we can use functional programming to solve this problem. <laughs> I don't think it can be done. Anyway, um, it's, really, it's really sneaky. You can only pull that off once. Um, mm, but it's useful nonetheless. All right. So that was kind of where we started. I got a guy who was really good at functional programming, and I pulled that trick on him. He started working on this problem. Um, but what we kind of quickly ran into, uh, I think we realized, fortunately, early on, uh, that we were solving the wrong problem. Um, and that the real problem we have is actually in the data model itself. It's actually, it sort of ties directly to the star schema and to the gap between the way we work with data in the analytical world in terms of star schemas and the way we work with data in the operational world, one sort of record at a time. Um, so what we've been working on lately is ways that we can basically kind of try to bridge that gap, where we could try to find a data model that is intuitive enough, uh, intuitive enough and explainable and understandable by an analyst, someone who knows SQL or R or something like that, but maps much more closely to the kinds of data models we see in production. All right? And again, I haven't solved this yet, and I don't know that I have the right answer, but I want to tell you guys like, roughly what I'm thinking about right now. Um, I'm calling it, like right now, I'm calling it a supernova schema. And it's a very, very simple idea. Um, I grabbed a bit of JSON here that kind of roughly illustrates what I'm talking about. Um, a supernova schema is basically a single denormalized record about an entity. And that might be, like, let's just say a person, for instance. If you guys were lucky enough, if you got to see Micah Whitaker talk yesterday about crunch and about building data pipelines, um, Cerner uses crunch to build data pipelines to create patient records. It is basically a single record stored in HBase that has all of the information about a patient you could want, all of their kind of static fixed attributes, their age, their address, all that kind of stuff, all of their lab results, all of their doctor's notes, all of these different things, all stored together in a single big denormalized record. And that's roughly what a supernova schema is. 
Um, there's a fixed set of scalar attributes, so basically attributes of the entity, like fixed attributes, things that would be roughly in the dimension table for that entity, like the customer dimension table inside of a star schema. Uh, and then it's a series of arrays that contain other sort of related data about that person. And each of those arrays roughly corresponds to a fact table inside of a star schema. So it would be an array that contains all of the person's transactions and all of their web visits, and all of their call center logs, and all of their lab data. Every single bit of information about them stored in an array. And you know, if you see this kind of schema and you're used to operational data models, this is very obvious, and this makes a lot of sense. This is the way we model data inside of HBase and inside of MongoDB. And it's the way we think about things like uh, search documents, like solar documents, that typically have a schema that's like fairly similar to this. It's a set of fixed attributes and then sort of one or more sets of repeated attributes about that entity, about that document in some sense. So the trick becomes, how exactly do we make this kind of schema understandable and approachable by someone who only really knows SQL? And the kind of metaphor I'm working with right now is actually, kind of, is actually sort of drawn from a DevOps kind of context in a way, and it's a little bit weird, um, but let me, just, let me try to describe it for you. Uh, in a DevOps context, I often do kind of remote execution across machines. I write like a single like bash script, and I want to execute that same exact script on like a thousand machines inside my cluster, just to set up something or like reconfigure something, something like that, right? So write the script once, execute that command everywhere across all those different machines. If you have a supernova schema, you can actually think of each of those kind of repeated structures, the transactions, the call logs, the web logs, it's basically a really tiny little SQL table. That's actually what it looks like. It's a really itty bitty tiny SQL table. And in the same way I can write a bash script and do remote execution across all these different machines, I can write a really tiny little SQL script that treats each of those repeated arrays as if they were tables, and I can execute that SQL script across all of the entities in my system, across every HBase row, across every Mongo record, across whatever sort of system I have, right? And then I can aggregate the results of those queries um, and then do whatever sort of subsequent processing on top of them I want to do, counting, filtering, aggregations, whatever kind of makes sense. And so I'm calling this basically querying within an entity. So this is like the queries you do kind of within each entity on just the information stored in just that record versus querying across entities, okay? Querying across all these different systems. Uh, and basically, I think my hypothesis is that feature engineering can basically be broken down into cases where you are querying within an entity and you were doing just pure feature creation on information that is only relevant to that person, and then where you're querying across entities in order to create some constants or create some kind of like segmentation scheme across all your different users, across all of your different entities, um, and that we can basically break down the feature engineering process into those two different categories. Um, and use that in order to like organize and transition computation from the analytical world into the operational world, where we can actually like literally reflect the data model from the analytical context as a supernova schema precisely into the operational context and actually just have it there and let it be updated in real time. Let it add new events to the supernova schema as things come in and then do rescoring and all the kind of typical stuff we would do on top of this new data. Um, yeah, that's, that's roughly what I'm thinking about these days. This is like on my mind. What is the best way to make these complex schemas available, accessible, usable by, by people who know SAS and SQL and R? And I have a few ideas along those lines and uh, I'm, I'm you know, happy to talk about this stuff more or take questions or whatever, but that's, that's basically my talk. Um, so thank you guys very, very much. So yeah, we have, we have a few minutes for questions if anyone wants to ask anything. I mean, it can be like about anything. You can ask me about you know, Spark or graph stuff or weird Google stuff. I mean, I, might, I may not be able to answer it, but I can try. Anything at all. Hey, how's it going? Good, thanks. Uh, I'm curious uh, to what extent like you mentioned the sort of analytics as a service mm -hmm. companies out there. Yeah. And you know, having used those sorts of things in different capacities, 
it's not clear to me that they're easier to maintain. You know, mm. you have external dependencies. Mm -hmm. You still have close tie-ins. Um, so I'm just curious, like, what's your take on that versus, you know, do it all yourself in-house and then having to build it from scratch? Uh, I don't know if it, it might come down to company size, you know, very contextual, but. Yeah, exactly. I, you know, I, I think um, it honestly, in my mind, kind of comes down to how important machine learning is to your company. I mean, you think of like, I mean, like Google search engines, but even like take like credit card companies, people who do credit card companies like fraud is their lifeblood. Like absolutely, they're, I mean, they are dead if their models are bad. I mean, that stuff will, in my mind, basically always be in-house because they will always be interested in the absolute edge, you know, they can get. Um, if machine learning is not really a big deal, then I think that like doing it, um, you know, as using as a service, an external thing, if you just kind of plan around, is an awesome way to get started. It's absolutely a fantastic way to say, hey, is this even remotely useful at all with a minimal amount of investment? Now, I think the interesting thing that we're going to see, and I, you know, I, I don't know, this is going to happen a lot faster than I think anyone realizes, is uh, deep learning stuff is going to become a real thing. And in order to kind of build the uh, convolutional neural networks, the underlying feature extraction systems, um, which is basically like feature engineering as a service, like feature engineering done for you, like the horrible dark art of data science, like done for you. This is the thing that honestly scares me for my job. So I, I speak about it with some trepidation, right? Um, but if Google could take Google Brain and Microsoft could take Atom and Berkeley could take systems like CAFE, which are all sort of deep learning training models, and provide those as a service, for problems like image classification, text classification, that kind of thing, that would be really, really interesting. And that would be the kind of like service that could really seriously disrupt in-house machine learning data science just because the models could just be so much better, like so much insanely better. You know, my only real worry, it's kind of weird, like, you know, we, we are willing to trade off understandability for a certain lift in performance. And that's sort of always the case, right? Um, so, you know, people are like, we talk a lot about understandability, interpretability of models, but then when we see deep learning, you know, doing 50% better, 75% better than the absolute state of the art that humans have done with basically no tuning, um, we're just like, screw it, thing works, who cares? We don't understand how the parietal cortex works either and we can still see, so like, let's not really like, let's not mess with success, guys. <laughs> um, anyway, long-winded kind of random answer, but I hope that's something, yeah. Hey, how you doing? Good, well, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, so when big data was coming, sort of coming out, it sort of promised that uh, the sample would be the population. Yeah. Um, but in the world of data science, it still seems that um, the samples that are worked on by machine learning algorithms still don't necessarily reflect um, the power of batch processing when it comes to the big data side of things. Mm. So I'm wondering, do you think that there is uh, any point in trying to recontextualize machine learning algorithms, maybe even using uh, languages like you know, not Python, more parallelizable languages like hmm. Clojure or S Scala mm -hmm. um, to introduce big data batch processing um, and larger sample sizes to the world of data science? And do you think if we were to do that, there would be a point of diminishing returns where the sample sizes we're working with don't necessarily yield better learned results? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I'll answer the last question first, which is yes, there's always a point where the sample sizes, you know, get so big that there's a sort of diminishing, diminishing bit of returns uh, or diminishing utility you get from adding more data. You know, I think the, the problem with like the sort of the thesis that we were going to do, uh, you know, very like, I'm trying to think out how to express this. The, the, the flaw, I think, in basically people saying that we were going to not sample anymore um, was basically kind of related to a, a misunderstanding of the dimensionality of the problem. Uh, for extremely high, like, so I mean, Google's ad CTR model has like a billion features, like literally a billion features. And if you have a billion features in order to like train them, you need a trillion observations, like a thousand to one, roughly speaking. If you have four features and they only have like a fairly limited amount of like, you know, variability in them, you honestly don't need that much data. <clears throat> you need like 4,000 observations, right? And like training beyond that is not going to yield you much benefit. So the sort of size of the, of the sample you need very much relates to the dimensionality of the problem, first and foremost. The second thing I would say is that I, I actually love sampling. Um, and what sort of big data modeling means to me is really ensemble modeling. It's building thousands, tens of thousands of small samples, fitting models to each of them, and then aggregating the results together. Um, 
I would love for there to be like really great Scala and Clojure sort of like, like models that existed for doing things like text classification, like image classification that are super, super high dimensional. I think the, the issue we run into is that those sort of super high dimensional problems are fundamentally systems problems. Like the reason you see guys like Jeff Dean, who like you know invented MapReduce, invented GFS, and, and Sanjay Gemawat at Google, working on stuff like Google Brain, is that like the math behind those systems, like the machine learning, can fit on an index card, and like an introductory calculus student can understand it. It's not a math problem; it's a systems problem. And so we're using systems programming languages like typically C++ in order to solve those things, just because that's what systems programmers use. You know what I mean? Um, for the rest of the stuff, for the sample stuff, the small, it's really effectively small data thousands of times. I think Python is fine. If people want to use Python, they want to use R. God bless them. No argument for me. Cool? And I think I'm out of time. So I'm, I'm actually, last, you know, last question. Is that all right, guys? Last question? Yeah, come on up. Sure. Uh, <coughs> so how useful are the uh, existing machine learning libraries could be? Because uh, usually we have seen that, you know, I've talked to so many people, they say that it's, the problems are always very customized, and so not yeah. always the machine learning. You can't really put a library down there and just run it and just use it, right? So yeah, so I think that's not true. Um, I think people kind of delude themselves in that regard. I actually think the, um, most of the work is really in the feature engineering, and people put an overemphasis on their algorithm, like, oh, we have to use neural networks. Oh, we have to use logistic regression. We have to use random forest. I think that's a bunch of BS. I think most people, it's, it's, it's sort of like cargo cult machine learning, effectively speaking. Like, you had a good experience once with neural networks, and now neural networks are it for you forever. Um, and I, I just basically think that's 100% false, and people are just deluding themselves. So, sorry. And with that, thank you guys very, very much. <laughs>